Hi, I'm Beck Mills, and welcome to Beyond the Band-Aid's premiere series, Invisibly Ill. During part one of the Invisibly Ill series, A Stealth Reality, we explore the concept of stealth infections and how they play a vital role in some of the world's most problematic neurodegenerative, neurobehavioral and chronic fatiguing illnesses. I think one way to think of it is when you have chronic infection that adversely affects the brain. It has different effects at different points in a person's life. If it affects fetal development, we see developmental disorders and autism. If it's in midlife, we may see depression, anxiety, cognitive impairments. If it's an early life, it, and sometimes fetal, it, it may show a psychosis like bipolar or schizophrenia. If it's in later life, it can be associated with dementia. But in all those cases, what they have in common is there's a uh, provocation of the immune system, and there's close communication between the immune system and the nervous system. It was just as if something had turned off, turned off the Parkinson's, and it was just unbelievable. The symptoms, they get so bad and the pain gets so bad that your mindset changes and you actually start to, to want to die. And, um, you know, there's no fear or anything involved. It, uh, it, it just becomes too much. I miss being a member of a society, I miss paying taxes, I'm, I miss contributing. You feel like you're trying to prove to people what's actually wrong with you. There's just such a lack of understanding about it. No one knows about it in this country and, and no one... Uh, I didn't quite understand it for a long time until Julian slowly taught me about it and I read some information from him and um, then I could have some more insight into his condition because when he told me he was sick, I didn't understand about it either. I thought, well, what, what, from a tick, how could you get so sick? It was quite shocking for me that such a, you know, one minute he's fine, the next minute he's going through, um, he's slowly deteriorating. And he's not one to put things on, so he, he suffered very silently. It hurts. Um. Here and there, and my tummy hurts. Yeah, and there, and my feet hurts as well. I'd never had any initial symptom. It just hit me. So either five to eight years later, just suddenly something knocked me over the edge. Stealth infections are in general uh, bacterial, but in some cases viral infections. They, they get inside and hide inside cells and they can't be seen by the immune system. And that's why they're called stealth infections. Now the most common stealth infections that are related to chronic illnesses are uh, number one, mycoplasma, chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, which is very, very common, um, Borrelia, burgdorferi, which is the, one of the causative components of Lyme disease, which is a complex illness involving not only Borrelia, but mycoplasma and other infections as well. Uh, all these infections uh, tend to not only spread throughout the body, but they tend to end up in areas like the central nervous system where they can cause tremendous havoc. The problem that we run into is that psychiatrists just think of neurotransmitters, and immunologists just think of cytokines and immune thing, immune functioning. And there's actually a lot of crosstalk between the immune system and the brain. But there isn't a lot of crosstalk between psychiatrists and immunologists. So despite the fact that I have two positive results 
from the world's leading Lyme disease specialists, backed up by clinical um, test results, uh, which conclusively show that I have Lyme disease. These infectious disease professors here in Australia continue to ignore um, my request for treatment, um, ignore my request for further antibiotics, and they send me away. Um, some have questioned my mental state of mind and referred me to psychiatrists. Some have blamed it on um, an allergy to grass. Um, they just look at every other uh, excuse or reason um, other than the fact that it's a bacterial infection. These people are causing people like myself a great deal of pain and suffering, which is totally and utterly uh, unnecessary. You're not going to treat Lyme unless you can diagnose Lyme. You're not going to diagnose Lyme unless you think of it. And you, you can only think of it if you know about it. It's kind of, again, it's really simple. Um, that's how it works in medicine. You know, consider this as part of your differential diagnosis. Just add Lyme disease to it. But you have to understand it. So it needs to be taught in medical school. If you look back over history, we've got something like 150 years of medical research that indicated some cancers have been caused by infection. And I think if I was going to pick the infection that best fit, fit that particular list, it would be Mycoplasma fermentans. I think there's a very strong possibility. We know that Helicobacter causes stomach cancer. Now, nobody ever talked about that. We know that Chlamydia pneumoniae can trigger off cancers. Mycoplasma fermentans, absolutely, as well. Mycoplasma fermentans has been found in the growing edge of breast cancers, so possibly solid tumours. So there's something like 200 types of mycoplasma. Now, you know, probably 10, 15 would affect humans. I mean, there's a mycoplasma alligatus, which alligators get. We know with mycoplasma fermentans, it switches on oncogenes, it switches on inflammatory cascades, so it shifts our interleukin cascades. I mean, it's a really nasty, nasty little bacteria. I mean, we're a, a laboratory. We, we need to have a doctor ask us to do a particular test. We don't go out and find patients and tell them we want to test them. Well, saying Lyme disease doesn't exist in Australia, but it exists in America, is like saying white shark attacks are only in Australia and they're not in America. It's, it's good for our tourism, or it's good for our belief system, but the reality is that when we look at it, these, these are infections that are worldwide, and they've been found on every continent except Antarctica, and probably would be there if you look long enough. The evidence in Australia so far goes back as far as 1959, when McCarris uh, looked at our wildlife and identified a Borrelia species on morphology, or the characteristic physical form of the bacteria um, as a Borrelia species in wallabies, kangaroos and bandicoots. And then there was a further publication by Carly and Pope in 1962 who actually isolated a Borrelia species and based again on the physical characteristics of the spirochete they identified a novel species and called it Borrelia queenslandica. So not only are people returning positives for Borrelia they're also returning positives against Babesia and Rickettsia and Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. So there are other tick-borne pathogens that are on board as well. So we need a broader research span and the clinicians need to be aware of this when they are investigating their patients. I'm Beck Mills. I, um, I'm a soft tissue therapist based in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. When people ask me why I got interested and what started all of this for me, I just I think back to 2009 when I first stumbled across a patient who suffered from fibromyalgia. This patient had seen 16, 16 or so doctors and specialists around Australia and had spent, I think she said something like $30,000, $40,000 on trying to find answers. When she did come to the point of telling me that she travelled overseas to see a fibromyalgia specialist, I was just like, wow, that's such a long way to travel. But then she actually started to tell me about what he was treating and what he was looking for. So a little alarm bell went off inside of me and I was just like, I started to buzz. I knew 
straight away that hearing about chlamydia ammonia, hearing about toxins, hearing about deficiencies, you know, and hearing about all these infections and how they play a role in, and why they play a role just made so much sense. Getting to the bottom of these illnesses early could save lives and I think that's really important to sort of keep in mind. Screening for stealth infections is not taught in medical school and I think it should be. This amount of information that's now available that suggests that these infections play a causal role is just incredible. Bob Bransfield, the psychiatrist, I found him incredibly interesting to talk to. Garth Nicholson, wow, what he has to bring. Uh, I think that these two probably, you know, hit out of the park with a lot of their research and what they've put together. The idea of the human body just being made up of microbes, it makes sense. Working in such an industry where you're exposed to so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of pain is so challenging. Once you learn about these infections and you learn about other toxins and you learn about how the combination of toxins and deficiencies and infections play a role in some of these chronic, these chronic illnesses, it just makes so much sense and you, and you feel like you need to tell people about it. It's just joining the dots. You know, it's definitely time to start changing the way that we think if we want to start beating these diseases.